This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From beautiful design templates and custom domains to full-blown e-commerce, email campaigns, and powerful analytics that you can set up in minutes, Squarespace is the place to go for all of your website needs. Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownson for Three Blind Men and an Elephant, and today I want to talk to you about Hasselblad's 907X50C Special Edition. Yeah, this one. The all-black one with special plaque commemorating the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11, and Hasselblad's storied relationship to NASA dating back to the original Mercury program, actually, in 1962. In fact, the camera and the story were so inspiring that Claudia and I hopped into our car for only the second time since mid-March and drove down to the Smithsonian's Air and Space Museum so that we could meld history and imagery like this. Of course, Hasselblads were not just out of this world, they were integral to this world, used by some of the greatest landscape, portrait, fashion, even street photographers, even rock and roll photographers of all time. I'm talking Ansel Adams, Arnold Newman, Bert Stern, Richard Avedon, Irving Penn, Helmut Newton, Deanne Arbus, Jared Mankiewicz, and so many more. Back to the future, baby. There is so much to cover about Hasselblad's history and the events around it that I'm going to leave that subject for another video. For now, let's just talk about the 907X50C Special Edition and, by extension while we're at it, the new Standard Edition, too. Although, yeah, why not a little bit about this one, too, the camera that really lit the afterburners of Hasselblad. This is the 500CM originally introduced as the 500C of 1957, just two years, in fact, after Marty McFly saved his future parents' relationship at the 1955 Hill Valley High School prom, and in the process, his own life. But before we get into it, a word from our friendly neighborhood Department of Commerce. First, I'm delighted to tell you that Streets of New York, the book, is back in stock. If you are like us and miss New York City, I think you'll really enjoy the 82 pages of images I made in the two years just prior to lockdown. Head over to www.3bmep.com books to learn more or order your copy. Second, we are now accepting appointments for half-hour, one-on-one live video sessions to explore with you everything from your portfolio to honing your artistic voice, how to manage social media, gear selection, and more. Head over to www.3bmep.com booking to take a closer look or schedule a session. Finally, if you like what you see here today, please give a thumbs up, subscribe, join the conversation below because this is an outstanding YouTube community. Consider using our no cost to you affiliate links or dropping coffee money via the PayPal link 
both available in the show notes down below. Better yet, please consider joining us as a patron on Patreon. However you choose to support us, as always, we thank you for it. Okay. For those of us coming from mirrorless full-frame APS-C or Micro Four Thirds systems, think of the 907X50C as a unique, modular, big-pitch, 50-megapixel medium-format camera with extraordinary heritage, industrial design, and image quality, which, in its standard guise, because the more expensive special edition has already sold out, is now available for pre-order for less than $7,000, which on the one hand is incredibly expensive compared to the cameras most of us own and use now. But on the other hand, is an incredibly modest proposition for those of us shooting with the only other modular medium format systems out there today, of which I'm aware. Anyway, Hasselblad's own H60, which starts at 15 grand with the same sensor. And Phase 1's 50 megapixel XFIQ3, which last time I looked was selling for a cool 27 large. Now, right, yeah, sure, I know. I haven't addressed Fujifilm's medium format GFX 50S, 50R, 100, Pentax is 645, or Leica's S-Type, though none of these are modular, and neither the Pentax nor Leica, like Hasselblad's own H6 series, in fact, are mirrorless. They are instead digital SLRs with optical finders. Nor have I addressed high-resolution full-frame cameras boasting between 40 and 61 megapixels from Canon, Leica, Sony, Panasonic, and Nikon either, nor the role of computational imaging via pixel shift. Hold those thoughts. But for those of us who love Hassies, or have been transfixed by the idea of Hassies, think of the 907X as Doc Brown's DeLorean, the vehicle by which we can travel through time, and the new CFV 250 c back as the flux capacitor that makes tide travel possible. Put the two together, currently you can get either only as part of the 907X 50C bundle, and you've got the equivalent of an X1D2 sans EVF in a form factor that any of us who has ever shot with the Hasselblad V-System film camera, think 500, 2000, or 200 series, will instantly recognize a cradle in your left hand, look down through the waist level finder to compose and focus, and trip the shutter with your right index finger, viewing and shooting experience, the waist level finder of old replaced with a modern, large, tiltable at 45 and 90 degrees rear LCD panel, the most robust tiltable panel I've ever seen. Those of us who have shot with and enjoy the SWC will immediately be comfortable with it too, once you've added the optional optical viewfinder. Even those of us who have shot with the Flex or Arc bodies will be comfortable with it, in fact may have the easiest time of all, because you're already used to focusing and composing with ground glass, either naked or with a loop, or with one of the finders, and then putting the back in place to capture the image. But in any case, the amazing thing is that you can now go forward in time or backward. You can go into the future by adding digital image quality and workflow to your film kit via the digital CFV 250C. Or you can go back in time by adding analog feel to your digital kit via the 907X body. Or you can be all of the moment with mod cons, as the Brits would say, and revel in the DNA of the original V series by embracing the 907X with CFV 250C back and XCD line of autofocusing lenses. The fulcrum of all of this is the CFV 250C because it is such a significant upgrade to the original CFV 50C back, the result of Hassi's development and refinement of the X1D series. Now, these upgrades include one, the best software interface in the industry taken from the H60 and X1D, including the ability to punch in for critical focus with a double tap on the touch screen. Just remember, do not try this at home unless mounted to a sturdy tripod because there can be significant rolling shutter in this magnified view. Two, dual UHS-2 card slots rather than the original single compact flash slot. Three, European, three, dramatically improved power options. The battery is now completely internal in a much nicer, cleaner package, and you can charge or power it externally via USB-C. And four, 
I'd call it the ability to more fully experiment with video at either 1080 or 2.7K at 30 frames per second with now dedicated mic and headphone jacks, woohoo, though absent any kind of HDMI port. The image quality, though, can be beautiful, even at night, like this. In fact, the X1D2 with that same sensor mounted to the little and relatively inexpensive, really like this lens, $1,100.45 f4p, gave me a small unobtrusive package that allowed me to capture images on the streets of New York last year, like this. So, wonderful stuff. However, there are a few buts, as there are with every camera, though this first one is a little different because... Okay, first, especially if you're a Hassie film shooter, be careful for what you wish. With this much resolution on tap in a digital workflow, you are now quite likely to see things you may never have seen before, including the slightest misfocus wide open. The good news is that by setting your V-series lens to bulb and setting your shutter to T, if you have a 500cm anyway, there are slightly different ways to do this on other V-system series bodies, you can check focus via live view either on the rear screen of the CF-V250C or Hasselblad's excellent Focus Mobile 2 app on iOS devices. Though they offer bigger screens than the CF-V250C alone and you can enable focus peaking, I think it's much better to double tap on those touch screens or use the magnifying glass on the laptops and desktops to punch in instead. It is also the case, however, that even superb lenses dating back to the 50s simply do not have the same technical competence that today's best lenses do. You can see this in just a couple of test frames, but really, you don't even need those. All you need to do is look at MTF charts because the differences are quite significant. Can the old glass still yield lovely images? You bet. They did half a century ago. This is also, however, about lens character. And I do understand the criticism leveled at some lenses for rendering too clinically. But you may well conclude that you do want to explore Hassi's newest lenses for those times when character is trumped by 
optical precision, or you simply want to travel light, or hey, you know, autofocus can be nice. In that case, 907X it is, or of course, X1D2 if you prefer. You simply cannot adapt the new lenses XCD or HC series to the V-System bodies because they're set for a much smaller flange distance. Hold that thought while I take a moment to thank our sponsor Squarespace for making this episode possible. With their elegant layouts, click drag and drop interface, customization tools, excellent support and more, Squarespace makes it a cinch for photographers and content creators, really any small to mid-sized businesses in any industry, to have an outsized presence on the web. And that has never been more important than now. Squarespace can literally have you up and running in minutes with a beautiful website and custom URL tailored to the way you want to present yourself. They really understand what it takes to build your online identity and grow your business. When you're ready to move beyond your basic site, Squarespace has you covered with their fully integrated and extensible platform. We know. Not only do we use Squarespace for our production company, blog, documentary, and personal photography sites, but we've integrated email blasts into commerce. We book our street photography workshops, sell our Streets of New York book, and just now have set up scheduling for those new one-on-one -on -one live video sessions I mentioned earlier, all through Squarespace. It just works. Not a systems admin in sight. Which doesn't mean I don't have questions, but again, Squarespace's customer service is terrific. So, hop over to squarespace.com slash hue for a free trial. And get an extra 10% off your first website or domain purchase when you're ready to really give it a go by using the discount code HUE at checkout. Again, that's squarespace.com slash HUE and discount code HUE at checkout. Thanks, Squarespace. Second, straight up, the autofocus is no different than that of the X1D2, but for most of us, this means slow and sometimes unsettled. In multiple attempts across a couple of days, for example, it simply would not lock onto clouds even against a bright blue sky. On the one hand, this is why I recommend manually focusing the X1D for street work, less futzing. On the other hand, I very much appreciate the autofocus for product shots, as once I tap on the screen where I want the point of focus, when I control the lighting, there's actually less futzing. Third, there is no IBIS. Now some of you think, hey, I shot before there was IBIS, no problem, but I think this is actually the biggest issue for anyone looking to get the most out of adding digital workflow to his or her bag of tricks when off tripod, especially with a lot of megapixels. IBIS can be very important for larger format, higher resolution sensors because you'll notice even the slightest motion blur from your subjects or you that again, you might not have picked up in the film days. Fourth. There are no electronic viewfinders for the 907X yet. There is no 45 or 90 degree prism finder, for example. No analog, say, to the PME 51. Not that it needs to be one or the other. A variable angle EVF would be even better. But the lack of an EVF deprives us of the full V-series shooting experience and one of the chief advantages of modularity. Trying to shoot the 907X at eye level is inherently at odds with how the original camera to which it pays homage was designed. And it does feel awkward. To me, anyway. Fifth, there's no weather sealing around the access door to the SD card slots, though there is a nice rubber lid to the ports. Doesn't matter. I'd avoid using it in anything remotely like a downpour. The remaining butts are really nits, but collectively, again, for me, they add up to a difference. So, sixth, the control collar around the shutter release is a very clever and minimalist way, I dig it, to quickly adjust aperture or shutter speed. But the shift button used to switch between aperture and shutter speed mode is slightly awkward and could be relocated. Seventh, depth of field preview is available via Focus Mobile 2, but it is not physically available on the 907X 
unless you buy the grip and assign that function to a shortcut button. Eighth? I hope it's eighth. Auto ISO is not available in full manual mode, and while that may not matter to many, I've found it can be a useful shortcut as I concentrate on real-time adjustments to shutter speed and aperture. Finally, ninth. Man, that sensor is prone to dust. Please bring back a dark slide for the digital age. All of which leaves us where, precisely? Well, how about here? If you're a fan of traditional V-series Hasselblads, I think you may well love the concept, feel, and function of the 907X50C. It is a revalidation of the very modularity and industrial design which likely brought you to Hasse in the first place, an absolutely stunning homage to the past. It's got the same form factor of the system you love, with incredible image quality that extends the life of your existing catalog of lenses and backs with a very simple and elegant user interface, as long as you don't start digging into the options, but you won't because you won't need to. Yet the 907X50C will also help you if you've grown weary, say, of manually transferring the EV value of your metered prism finder to your lens, shorten the distance between intent and execution if you embrace its aperture preferred, shutter preferred, or full auto modes. You may revel in the autofocus as well. In either case, weary or not, the 907X50C will allow you to take many more photos or see them faster, which is actually a boon to honing your craft or having more keepers because it speeds up the feedback loop. Like the Hassies of yore, it plays very well with flash too. This was a primary reason, in fact, for the decision to go leaf shutter in the original 500. Not the only one, I know. Those focal plane shutters back in the late 40s and early 50s were simply not reliable enough for Hasselblad. Still, you may be disappointed that you will not be able to use any of your finders on the 907X. You can still use them, of course, on your V-System body, though I suspect with time Hasselblad will figure out a way to offer a vary angle EVF that can mount to the 907X50C, say, the same way as the optical finder, perhaps attached via USB cable. To be determined. Ultimately, migrating your film workflow to the digital era will be most seamlessly accomplished by entering it through the 907X50C. But, competition is fierce. So, let's talk about that. Fujifilm's 50 megapixel medium format GFX50S, in particular, with rear tilty screen and optional tilting EVF adapter, it comes with an EVF as well, gives you the functionality of waist level and eye level shooting and everything in between for a similar 6100 bucks. Though the back is not interchangeable, and it is a very different handling experience, there is no denying it's a very competent camera capable of beautiful imagery with lenses that sell for as much as 40% less than comparable Hassi glass. I'm thinking at the moment in particular of Fujifilm's GF 110mm f2. Gorgeous, gorgeous lens. Their 102 megapixel GFX100 is an extraordinary capture device which, in addition to twice the number of pixels, offers by far best autofocus and burst rates in class and, unique among medium format cameras, not only in-body image stabilization, but robust 4K recording. But this is a big and heavy beast which goes for 10 grand body only, a different kettle of fish. Fujifilm also offers the rangefinder, well, Texas rangefinder style GFX50R with the same sensor as the GFX50S, but this one has, to mix metaphors, never been my cup of tea. Still, it's 3500 bucks, making it the least expensive way to break into the mirrorless medium format world if you're buying new. But when you're more comfortable at that price level, it really does make sense to look at high-resolution full-frame cameras, in particular the 61-megapixel Sony a7R4, 47.3-megapixel Panasonic S1R and Leica SL2, the 
45.7 megapixel Nikon Z7, 45 megapixel Canon EOS R5, 42.5 megapixel Sony A7R3, A7R2, or how about Leica's own Back to the Future 40 megapixel M10R and M10 monochrome? All but the Leica M's offer IBIS and highly performance autofocus systems and lenses, a number of which far exceed the best optics available for the HASI just a few short years ago, generally at lower prices. There is simply nothing in any medium format lens catalog that can come close to the variety, versatility, and price ranges of smaller sensor lens ecosystems. I'm not just talking about full frame now, especially when it comes to zooms and long tellies. Then again, smaller sensor systems don't have quite the same medium format look. Though, if you can, Try out something like Sony's brilliant FE-135 1.8 or Leica's extraordinary Aposumicron 90mm F2 and tell me what you think then. In any case, Hassi's current catalog does contain a number of truly wonderful lenses, three of which in the XCD line I find myself returning to again and again, a fourth when I have the need and I can snag a borrowed one. The 45 F4P for street work and general purpose shooting, the 93.2 for portraiture, the 21 F4 for dramatic wide shots and interiors, and the brilliant 81.9 wide open when I'm looking for shallow yet sparkling street portraits in an age of six-foot social distancing. For those of you coming from the full-frame world, think of them as fields of view and depths of field full-frame equivalents of 35 2.8, 72.8, 16 2.8, and yeah, 50 millimeter 1.4. For those of you coming from the V-System, call these the fields of view and depths of field equivalents closest to something like the Zeiss Distagon C63.5, Sonar C150 F4, Biogon C3845, or Planar 82.8. The Sony A7R series, along with Panasonic S1R and Leica SL2, offer pixel shifting, which allows them to capture images of as much as 240 megapixels each, and this is an extraordinary technology. Even... Panasonic's 20 megapixel Micro Four Thirds G9 has pixel shifting, and when you can control the frame, the results can be surprising. But pixel shifting works only with static subjects, and even a gentle breeze may be enough to make that function irrelevant for landscape, never mind fashion or portrait. On the other hand, how many of us really need more than even 40 megapixels worth of data? How often? Not many, not often. Do most of us need even that much resolution? Nope. But none of these cameras are for most people and a Hasselblad shooter is an even rarer bird. And that's just fine, vive la différence. But it is also true that none of these manufacturers save for Leica can match the build quality, industrial design, or heritage of Hasselblad. And you most assuredly will not save any money buying into full frame, let alone medium format, Leica. I know. Let's wrap this up for now, this way. In the end, I'd say that you really have to love the way the 907X50C can do, and the way it does it to justify the premium for and accept the limitations of it. If you can control the frame, I really have come to focus on this point. Think fashion, food, portrait, product, dance, or landscape photography. If playing well with studio flash in particular matters to you, if build quality, heritage, industrial design, feel are higher on your list of priorities than 10 tenths autofocus video or IBIS, if your style is deliberate and methodical, and if you have the financial wherewithal, you need to at least put a 907X50C in your hands. Because this is precisely how I came to understand that the 907X and that 1979 one owner 500CM are the two Hassies I didn't know I was waiting for. Until I did. One more thing. As I'm recording this, we are 72 days away from the U.S. presidential election. In the course of identifying milestones in Hassi's history, I 
rediscovered or learned for the first time so much about the last century and a half that strikes me as more relevant than ever in the run-up to the 2020 elections here in the United States. If you are so inclined, I offer you this suggestion. Google List of Presidents of the United States and then read about the presidencies of the men in office for the specific years I'm about to give you, each of which corresponds to one of those Hasselblad milestones. I'll get to this in another video too. So, ready? 1841, 1881, 1908, 1924, 1937, 1940, 1957, 1960, 1969, 1979, 2002, 2004, 2019, in 2020. If you do, I think you will be the richer for it. This is precisely what I mean when I say that photography is the lens through which I study history, why I think this presidential election is the most important one to get right since 1932, go out and vote, and why Back to the Future for me, is so much more than one of the greatest science fiction films of all time. Time machine. I haven't invented any time machine. Okay, all right, I'll prove it to you. Look at my driver's license. It expires 1987. Look at my birthday, for crying out loud. I haven't even been born yet. And look at this picture. It's my brother, my sister, and me. Look at her sweatshirt, Doc. Class of 1984. Pretty mediocre photographic fakery. They cut off your mother's hair. I'm telling the truth, Doc. You gotta believe me. Then tell me, future boy, who's president of the United States in 1985? Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan? The actor? <laughs> then who's vice president? Jerry Lewis. I suppose Jane Wyman is a first lady. Whoa, wait, Doc. And Jack Benny is secretary of the treasury. Oh. Doc, you gotta listen to me. I got enough practical jokes for one evening. Good night, future boy. No, wait, Doc. Doc, the, the, the bruise, the bruise in your head. I know how that happened. You told me the whole story. You were standing on your toilet and you were hanging a clock and you fell and you hit your head on the sink. And that's when you came up with the idea for the flux capacitor, which is what makes time travel possible. Thanks again to Squarespace.com for making this episode of Three Blind Men and an Elephant possible. For all of your website needs, if you're a small or mid-sized business, a solopreneur, Squarespace is the place to go. Get your free, no-strings-attached 14-day trial at www.squarespace.com. And if at the end you decide you really love it and are ready to go for it, save 10% by using the discount code HUE at checkout.